my name is Pete Upton. As Kirsten said, I'm the interim executive director for the Native CDFI Network. And we're proud to bring you Pilar Thomas today as we discuss the State Small Business Credit Initiative. And most of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors for bringing this to you, which is the OISTA Corporation, the Sovereign Council of Hawaiian Homestead Associations, and Clearinghouse CDFI. This is going to be a two-part series. The first ser event is today, January 4th, and then next week at the same time, we'll have the follow-up. And it's presented by Pilar Thomas of Quarles and Brady. Um, the, um, we had many um, requests from many tribal governments, native CDFIs, about how to use the SSBCI program to support existing and aspiring native small business owners in their communities. So I could think of nobody better than to reach out to Pilar. Um, she knows the program inside and out, and it's just a, um, she's a wealth of knowledge. So I'm very proud to bring Pilar Thomas as she presents four ready-made models for participation by tribal governments and native CDFIs in the SSBCI program. And it's a great vehicle for Indian countries economic development recovery. So the um, Pilar is a partner with Quarles and Brady. She focuses her practice on tribal renewable energy, project development and finance, tribal economic development, federal Indian law and natural resource development. She serves as general counsel for several tribes, section 17 and tribal business entities. Prior to her legal career, Pilar worked for 15 years in the financial services industry for a Fortune 250 company. She has experience in all aspects of consumer mortgage, commercial lending, including underwriting and credit risk. So I don't want to um, spend too much time on introductions because an hour goes fast and we're already into about five minutes of our hour. So Pilar, um, take it away. Great, thank you, Pete. And uh, first of all, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, do I have screen share? Yes, you do, Pilar. You should be able to share the screen. There you go. Okay. Um, what are we seeing? Are we seeing just yes. a single screen? Yep, you are seeing your presentation. Okay, great. Um, so again, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, welcome to 2022. Let's hope it ends up better than 2020. As someone said, 2022, we don't want it to be like that. But um, speaking of recovering from COVID, I um, hope everyone has been safe um, and staying safe uh, and are try trying to continue to avoid this uh, COVID pandemic. Um, as Pete said, my name is Pilar Thomas. I'm a partner in the law firm of Quarles and Brady. I'm based out of Tucson, Arizona, uh, and I've been working very closely with my clients and others uh, around implementing ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, and the State Small Business Credit Initiative. Uh, for those of you who may know me or have already met me or participated even in some of my previous webinars, um, my goal really here is to try and help CDFIs think about how they can participate uh, with tribes in uh, accessing the state small business credit initiative funds. Uh, and as I've worked with Pete and other CDFIs, um, we've been able to identify a handful of models that uh, either have been implemented before by states uh, in the previous rendition of SSPCI. Uh, and, and so some of these models are not new, a couple are new, but some of these are not new. Uh, with respect to how CDFIs have participated in this program uh, in the past. Um, so let me, that's my background. Let me just quick, quick agenda. We're gonna go through some quick program updates um, just to bring everybody up to speed on where the SSBCI uh, program is implementation. I'm gonna do a quick summary of programs, which is kind of a refresher, um, a refresher around statutory requirements because uh, regardless of how we participate um, as a CDFI, we have to be able to comply with the statutory requirements as well as the policy guidance requirements in the program. Um, and then I'm going to ad address uh, in a little bit more detail two models 
uh, participation models that CDFIs, um, I think, have an opportunity to create from a turnkey perspective. And I'll, I'll discuss in a little bit more detail what that means. But one of the things that I see in working both with my other clients and with others around the country is that tribes, as we all know, lack a lot of capacity and especially smaller tribes. So to the extent that partners with tribes such as CDFIs can create turnkey solutions, and I'll describe what that means as we go through the models and especially as we get into the final part of program design, focusing on the application, right? Our goal is by February 11th, have as many tribes as possible apply for this program. December 11th, eight tribes had to raise their hand and issue for their notice of intent. February 11th, they have to actually submit the application. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about maybe some opportunities that the CDFIs, uh, CDFIs have to work with their tribe or tribes in their areas. Um, even if you don't have a tribe as a sponsor, working with the tribes in your area, to develop some turnkey that makes it easier for the tribes. And that's because it's the tribes who have to submit the application, not a CDFI. Um, the tribes can't delegate this authority to somebody. They can only do it themselves. So, uh, so one of the opportunities we have here is to create these turnkey solutions. So some real quick program updates. We finally got policy guidance from Treasury in, on November 10th. I encourage you to read through it. It's about 45 pages. I'll have, I have a summary of it here, uh, at least the most relevant part to, um, to our discussion. Um, the app actual application form and instructions have been published. They're on the website as well. And I'm gonna go through some key parts of the application as part of our program design. There is a new fact sheet as well as some new FAQs uh, that describe uh, parts of the, uh, or clarify parts of the uh, policy guidance. And that's especially, there's two aspects, one's around tribes and one's around venture capital programs. Um, and then finally, there's some updated tribal government allocations. If you remember, the tribes got $500 million out of the $10 billion pot of money as a set aside. Um, there were two other set asides. There was a SETI, which stands for Socially and Economically Disadvantaged Individual Owned Businesses. There was a $1.5 billion SETI set aside. The tribes will get $100 million of that $1.5 billion. So that allocation has already been made. Tribes have already received the notice of that allocation, their allocation from the $100 million. There is also an incentive fund of a billion dollars. That allocation, tribes will get a $69 million set aside from that $1 billion. Those allocations have also already been made and the tribes have also received notice of what that number is. Treasury has told us that after December 11th, they're going to reallocate the funds from the tribes that did not file a notice of intent. So tribes should be receiving soon a new number. If you filed, your, if the tribe filed its notice of intent, then it will be getting a new number based on the reallocation, or they called it a recalculation, but basically a reallocation from those tribes that didn't apply. As I understand it, about 380 tribes did file a notice of intent. That leaves 200 tribes that didn't. And so their funds are gonna be reallocated to the 380. Then for a tribe to actually get money, it has to file its application on, February, by, on or before February 11th. And then after that date, those monies will be reallocated again. So if you make it all the way through, you're going to get a lot more money than your initial application. Um, as again, as a refresher, a quick reminder of what kind of programs we're talking about, there are basically five types of programs. The application has room for seven. Um, they split some of these up. So I'll go to that uh, in a little bit more detail later, but we have a capital access program, which is basically an insurance program for portfolio loan loss reserve. 
Uh, most tribes are probably not going to do a cap access program simply because you need a lot of loans um, to create a massive loan reserve. Uh, we, will, we do expect to see more tribes interested in a loan guarantee program because it's relatively easy. Everybody knows how that works. Um, a lot of lenders are used to loan guarantee programs, especially those that operate SBA loan guarantees or have worked with the BIA for their loan guarantee or USDA for its loan guarantee. So a lot of models out there for that. Collateral support programs are really a cash collateral program where the money is used to boost collateral that might be needed by a lender um, and it comes in the form of cash. Loan participation programs, there are really two types of programs here. Uh, for loan participation. One is a loan purchase program uh, where you, the tribe uh, would use the SSBCI money to buy a portion of a loan made um, to a small business. Um, another way to do it is to make a companion loan um, or to co-fund a loan where at the same time, the senior, the bank makes a loan, the tribe makes a second loan um, and so the, the, the borrower in effect has two loans. So that's a loan participation program. Uh, and then the venture capital programs are equity investments. Uh, for purposes of this presentation with the CDFIs, I'm gonna focus um, on the loan programs uh, since most CDFIs are doing loans. Um, I understand a handful of, of CDFIs might also be equity investors. Uh, and so if there's any interest in any further information on that, um, I'll be happy to uh, talk to that a little bit further. Um, some things to keep in mind for us as, as we're participating, especially if we're thinking about participating as an administrator, uh, but even if we're participating as a lender, we, the, the tribe itself has to show that its programs meet these statutory requirements. So we keep this in mind when I talk about developing a turnkey program design. If you work with your tribe or tribes uh, to develop a loan program, whatever that loan program might be, you have to make sure that you understand and that that program meets these requirements, these statutory requirements. So remember, we got a one-to-one. -one. For every dollar of SSBCI, we've got to go find another dollar of private money. Treasury has told us that that private money can include CDFI funds, regardless of the source of those funds. In the policy guidance, Treasury says that other dollar cannot come from the tribal government, state government, or federal government, except CDFI money. So if you've been capitalized by federal grants, then you can use that money, even though it came from the federal government, as part of the one-to-one. -one. So however you participate as a lender, as a borrower, or as an administrator, you're going to have to put up that other buck. So keep that in mind. Um, demonstrate reasonable expectation is going to be 10 times the federal contribution. So our goal is a 10 to 1 overall in total. So each program has to meet a one-to-one, -one, but all the programs together have to add up to a 10-to-1. Financial lenders have to have their own capital resources at risk. And Treasury has said that's at least 20% of the risk of loss has to, be, has to go to the uh, lender. So if you're going to participate as a lender in a CDFI program, and that's one of the models, we'll go through that in a little bit more detail, you've got to be prepared to have 20% of that loan amount be your risk. Um, and then lastly, we have a target borrower size of 500 employees, no more than 750, average loan principal of 5 million, no more than 20 million. Um, hardly gonna see, we're unlikely to see these loan sizes in Indian country. You never know. Most tribes aren't gonna get $5 million to lend. Most tribes are gonna get under a million dollars so, um, so I'm not so worried about the loan size and, and, and the borrower size as well. Um, additional statutory requirements. And again, this is gonna be important for us to keep in mind, if, especially if we're interested in administering a program. The tribe has to show in its application how it, the, the program is gonna benefit the tribe. Tribes are considered states under the law. 
tribal members and tribal small businesses through expanded economic opportunities, through jobs, through the types of jobs, lots of full-time jobs, um, tax revenue. I'll go in a little bit more detail of what Treasury has identified as expanded economic opportunities. We also have to be able to show that there's operational skill, capacity, and experience of the management team, the ability to manage increases in small volume lending and internal accounting and admin control. And overall, the tribe has to show it's a sound program design and a sound implementation plan. That's why partnering with CDFIs is a great way for the tribes to take advantage of CDFI skill sets. Right, Most tribes don't have the operational skill to run a lending program, but you do. Most tribes don't have the ability to manage increases in loan programs, but you do. Most tribes don't have a lending, accounting, and administrative control program, but you do. So as tribes are developing these application information, CDFIs provide a unique opportunity uh, to, to lend your experience in these areas. And the treasury is gonna look at this overall soundness of program design and how it's gonna be implemented. Um, obviously, CDFIs are in the business today of making loans, well, most of them. So, and not all of them to small businesses. So you gotta remember, you've gotta have some small business lending capacity and, and, and experience. Uh, but the more tribes can show, yeah, we've got a built-in system. We've got a turnkey system. We're ready to hit the ground running. Once we get our money, we can start putting that money out the door. That's part of the soundness of program design that I think CDFIs can really uh, uh, bring to the table for tribes. Okay, uh, let me make sure I got, I'm trying to check the chat box. Um, finally, the secretary has to approve these applications. And so in addition to those previous requirements, they're gonna take a look at things like experience and capacity, investment authority, what the loan terms and conditions are, what your state's gonna do, what the loan purposes are. So, so this is all part of program design. Let me turn to general policy guidance real quick. Re uh, remember, tribes are gonna get their money in three tranches. Um, a third, a third, a third. They have to obligate, transfer, and expend at least 80% of each tranche before they get the next tranche. Um, ex transfer, this is going to be critical to implementation. Transfer also means like literally sending the money from the tribe's bank account to your bank account. So if you are administering the program for a tribe and they transfer their first tranche to you, then they can go get their second tranche. Now, tribes have to decide how they're gonna split this money up between all the programs. Uh, and they have to tell treasury that in the application. So this is part of working with the tribe is how much money do you want to go into one of these programs? Um, and the nice thing about these tranches is that you can, you know, if you do three programs, you can do, you can Im implement them separately, right? We'll get our first tranche, we'll implement this program, we'll get our second tranche, we'll implement the second program. So you can stage implementation, um, or you can try and do them all at once. The critical thing, though, is Treasury wants this money out the door. So they say, if you don't spend your first tranche within three years, you're not going to get more money. So implementation quickly in three years uh, doesn't seem that quick, but <laughs> relatively speaking, it is. You got to spend the second tranche within six years or you won't get more money. They also make a note that you have to be ready to implement these programs within 90 days of approval. Who knows how long that will be? Another reason to have turnkey solutions designed for the tribes. Tribe, you do this program with us and we can start putting money out the door immediately. Um, that's gonna meet this 90 day implementation requirement. Um, if you use a third party administrator, they have to be supervised by federal, state or tribe. If you're a certified CDFI, that counts as federal supervision. If you're owned by the tribe, that, tribes is, that counts as tribal supervision. They claim there has to be an open and competitive process, but uh, 
I asked them a question a couple of weeks ago. What does that mean? What if I just have a CDFI that I want to send all my money to? They said, well, just explain why you did that. So, um, so that'll be part of if you're working with a tribe and, and they don't really have anybody else that's going to administer just you, the CDFI, then we should be thinking about the rationalization for those of you in the federal government or former federal employees. You know, we call that um, JOFO, right? Justification uh, for, uh, for uh, financial offers. So you have to make sure we've got something uh, lined up there and that's part of that turnkey solution. Um, there are going to be some limitations on loan products, especially around customer protection standards. There's a rate cap, um, which is based on, on NCUA rates. I think right now that's 13% cap. There can't be any prepayment fees, and the upfront fees can't be more than 2%. But you can charge upfront fees, so that's the key. And something to think about when you're thinking about how does the CDFI get compensated? It's through charging some upfront fees, whether it's a guarantee fee or a loan origination fee. And then we have to worry about reporting requirements um, on uh, either quarterly or annually. Tribe specific. So this is gonna be something we have to think about participating in CDFIs. The tribes can lend and invest just about anywhere. Any small business located on tribal lands, which is defined to include tribal fee land, trust lands, and Alaska Native Corporation lands. Tribal member or tribal member own, tribal member or tribal owned businesses located in any state. So if your tribe's in Mississippi and you have tribal members in Kentucky, the tribe can make investments in Kentucky to the tribal member businesses located or to their own enterprises. Um, or to any small business in any state. Now we still have to keep in mind we have to show benefits. Um, to get this 100% SETI, uh, to get the SETI incentive, the tribe has to spend 100% of its SETI funds in SETI businesses. So if a tribe gets $50,000 in SETI funds, then that $50,000 has to be invested in a SETI business. All tribal member owned businesses are included in the definition of SETI as are all small business owners who live in a CDFI investment area or any small business that's located within a CDFI investment area. So there's an alignment between where you can lend money and the SETI uh, definition. So that's good. That means every loan you make is gonna be a SETI loan and the tribe's gonna get their SETI incentive. Additional specific guidance for the tribal enterprises. Um, first of all, it's defined consistent with the SBA hub zone definition, so it's owned in whole or in part uh, by a tribe as long as the other owner is an American citizen. Um, these enterprises can implement and administer SSBCI programs on behalf of the tribal government. So if your native CDFI is considered a tribal enterprise, it is owned by the tribe, then you can implement and administer. Now, even if you're not owned by the tribe, tribes can third party contract. So even if you're a non-tribally affiliated, I'm gonna say native CDFI, you can still, the tribe can still contract with you to administer. Um, tribal enterprises can be lenders or investors. They can show sufficient lending or investing experience, financial and managerial capacity. I'll circle back around on why that is important for us from a tribal perspective. Um, when I talk about program design. Um, enter pri tribal enterprise funds can be considered private financing for purposes of both the one-to-one -one and the 10-to-one. -one. Again, your money, the CDFI money that comes from the federal government can also be used for the one-to-one, -one. but if you partnered with another tribal enterprise, their section 17 or their tribally chartered entity, and those folks had some money to invest, you could go get money from them as part of that private leverage investment. And I'll talk about that um, next week when I talk about partnering with folks to create programs for tribes. Um, tribal enterprises are also permissible borrowers, so you can lend money to a tribal enterprise as the CDFI. Um, there are limitations on gaming enterprises and conflict of interest policies. Um, however, it, even if a tribal enterprise does operate gaming facilities, they can use these funds for non-gaming related businesses, 
but not for their gaming activities. So, you know, XYZ Gaming Authority has a casino and a hotel and an amphitheater and a golf course and some restaurants. They can use, they can, that, that gaming authority can borrow money, but can only use it for the non-gaming type activities. So they can use it to build a hotel, but they can't use it to expand the gaming facility or to buy some slot machines or to invest in a sports betting. Um, okay, so let's focus on loan programs because this is primarily where we are um, from a CDFI perspective. There are four, again, four basic types of loan programs. I'm gonna focus on loan guarantee and loan participation. And that's primarily because that's where in the first go round of SSBCI, the CDFIs participated. Um, some of the after action reports show the credit access program, capital access program were run by the states. We're all mostly run by the states. Again, those have to be big, massive programs because they're big insurance, basically insurance policies. Um, so most CDFIs uh, did not run a credit access program. They might have participated in one, but they as a lender, but they didn't really run one. Same with cash collateral. Uh, the states found that most of their juice was in loan guarantees and loan participation. Um, all right, let me pause here. Um, so there's a question real quick. Let me go back up some questions here. Does the CDFI receiving the transferred funds have to be a tribal CDFI? The answer is uh, no, no. You don't have to be a native CDFI. And the CDFI is in the first go round and I'm gonna go through some of the models. So I'll answer that in a little bit more detail um, in some of the models of what other states did. Um, so let me reserve that for ju in just a few minutes. Are there templates for third-party contractings between the tribe? Um, we, I actually do have a third-party contracting template. Um, Treasury has offered to provide us with contact information from folks uh, who have done, uh, had CDFIs administer. Um, and so we've got some examples of that. Uh, gaming is listed, but what about marijuana? No illegal activities. Those are ineligible businesses and ineligible uses. Cannot do anything that violates federal law, i.e. marijuana enterprises. Um, the same limitations that exist in the SBA, uh, limitation on businesses and uses are the same limitations the Treasury. If you're familiar with the power, the, the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, those also had limitations. Uh, so, uh, so cannabis, illegal, can't do it. Gaming had a limitation. Additional lending had a limitation, except they've created an exception for tribes here. Uh, passive investments, speculative investments, so you cannot use this money to, you know, go buy Bitcoin. Can't do it. Can't use this money to invest in your cannabis. You can't use this money for passive real estate investment. So you can't use it to just, you know, buy an apartment complex and ride it out. Um, uh, and again, I would point you to the policy guidance for the limitations. Um, yeah, you could use it for hemp because that's legal, but not THC. Um, okay, with that, let me talk a little bit more detail. Loan participation, as I explained earlier. Hey, this is, yes, yes, um, Pete. There was one more question. Um, said, did I hear the CDFIs can use federal grants as a one-to-one -one match, or did I mishear that? Yeah, so, so we asked Treasury specifically. We said a lot. Of, most Native CDFIs are capitalized by federal grants. So you've said you can't use federal grant money for the one-to-one. -one. And as an example, you can't use fiscal recovery fund money to provide that other dollar of private investment. But Treasury said, we're not going to look at that for the CDFIs. So however the CDFI is capitalized, that's the other private dollar. And we've asked them to clarify that in an FAQ. So we have it in writing. Um, okay, so we've got loan participation. Again, this was one of the more heavily used programs between tri uh, states and CDFIs. So part of this is a direct companion loan where the, where the companion loan is made directly to the borrower. 
uh, in concert with the private lender, um, or there's a co-funded loan in partnership with a CDFI. Um, in this case, if you do a direct companion loan, so it's two loans to the borrower, one from the private lender uh, and one from the tribe as the CDF, uh, as a, using SSBCI funds. Um, in that case, the tribe has to service that companion loan because they're making a separate loan. Of course, if the tribe partnered with the CDFI, where the CDFI is making the companion loan, and that's one of the models we'll talk about in just a minute, then it's the CDFI who would then service that loan. Um, then there's the loan purchase where the loan is made and at closing, the tribe would buy a portion of the loan using the CDF, the SSBCI funds. Sorry, too many letters for me now. Um, in that case, the lender is gonna service that whole loan, including the loan that's been, portion of the loan that's been purchased. The key here is that the CDF, the SSBCI funded loan is typically subordinate to the lender's loan. So if a lender makes, um, you know, a hundred thousand dollar loan, and the borrower needs one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, then the tribe would say, okay, here's fifty thousand dollars for the second loan that gets you up to one hundred and fifty, and that SSBCI loan will be subordinate to the lender's loan. Um, so that's a loan participation. Alternatively, same hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan, the lender makes the hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan. And the tribe says, okay, we'll buy $50,000 of that off of you. And they literally just buy the loan. So now the lender still has, of course, $150,000 loan, but that they're servicing, but their risk is only the $100,000. Uh, and again, the lender is going to get paid before the SSBCI portion of the loan gets paid. That's the subordination. Okay, so loan guarantee, pr again, pretty simple. It's an assurance to the lender that they're gonna get partial repayment if the loan goes into default. The lender, of course, has to make reasonable efforts to collect uh, on collateral, collect on personal guarantees, collect on the loan. Um, in, in the SSBCI world, we have to remember our one-to-one. -one. So that usually means a loan guarantee of 50% or less. Right, because their risk has to be at least 20%, but you got to have at least another buck in private investment. So, um, so your average loan guarantees in the previous were between 30 and 50%. For if you have a loan guarantee, you take that SSBCI money, you segregate it into a cash account. Sometimes the lenders want to control that cash account because they want to make sure they get paid when they, they need to collect on the loan guarantee. Sometimes you'd set it aside in an escrow account, might be controlled by the tribe, third party, or the lender. Depends on how the tribe wants to negotiate that, uh, or uh, again, the CDFI if it's the administrator. Some key attributes we have to think about as we're, whether we're a lender or an administrator. What's our experience? What's our underwriting infrastructure? What kind of loan terms do we wanna have? We're gonna to have to put this in the program application. So we need to be thinking about the size, what they would use it for, what the rate is, how long the loans are. The shorter the loans, the more you can turn them over, the more you turn them over, the higher your 10 to one ratio, right? Because every time you re-lend that SSBCI money, that counts towards your 10 to one ratio. So shorter terms, Smaller loans um, would make for more turnover. That's something to be worked out with the tribe, but it's also a component of a model design. You're already familiar with the kinds of loans you make, with the kinds of programs that you run, the types of loans people can uh, need, the size of loans. You're already familiar with your market. This is one of the big cases around using and leveraging CDFIs. You know what that small business market is. You know what the demand is. You know what kind of businesses there are. So if a tribe wants to focus on a certain type of business, it, that's its decision to make. But if you're working with the tribe to decide what kind of money, what would we use this money for? What kind of businesses do we want to support? You have to make sure you have sound underwriting standards, which you know, because you're making loans already. 
But the tribe also has to get familiar with some underwriting standards. The tribe may want to say, yeah, we know we sound underwriting standards are one thing, but we're trying to attract businesses that can't get funding anywhere else. So we might have to loosen up our underwriting criteria. And that's really the purpose of the SSBCI money, right? To reduce your risk because they're supporting you in some way. Um, you have to be flexible in your guarantee or participation percentages. Is it 50%? Is it 30%? Does it matter if it's a brand new client, brand new small business? Maybe they get a higher loan guarantee because they're way more risky versus an established business and they maybe get a lower loan guarantee. So you have to be thinking about those kinds of things. Who's your qualified network? Are you targeting? And then finally, compliance, data gathering, and reporting. Okay, so first model, CDFI is lender or borrower. In other words, you are participating in the program as not as an administrator, but as a participant. So as a lender, you would be a part of the tribe's lender network. There might be some tribes that are pretty big, are gonna run their own programs. Um, or maybe have joined with other tribes to run joint programs. So one opportunity for you is to be the lender, right? Hey, tribe A, B, C, we want to join any tribe that's got a loan guarantee program. We're happy to be involved in the tribe's loan guarantee program. So you're going to be a part of the tribe's lender network. You're going to get that credit support for whatever program the tribe decides to do whether it's loan participation, loan guarantee, cash collateral. Um, but you have to be prepared to have meaningful capital at risk. That's at least 20% of the risk of loan loss. You have to be able to provide assurances to the tribes that you will not make loans to ineligible businesses or for ineligible uses or to ineligible borrowers. Um, and I'd separate businesses from borrowers because even if you are an eligible business, the business owner cannot be a sex predator. So they're an ineligible borrower. So uh, the policy guidance lays this all out. The tribes will have this in their allocation agreement. And you will, in effect, have to assure that you will comply with both the tribe's rules and the, the statutory and policy guidance rules. We also know you're going to be limited to your investment area. Right. So if your investment area is in Arizona, you can't make loans to people in New Mexico unless you have both of them or in Oklahoma. So if you're tied with a tribe, tribe A says we're going to just use our CDFI as a lender and the tribe is tribal members everywhere. You're only going to be able to lend to those tribal members. Let's say they, they target just tribal members. You're only going to be able to lend to people within your investment area. So you have a limitation there. Uh, that has to be acknowledged and that's part of the aspect of the tribe's design. You may need to comply with the tribe's loan requirements. Some tribes, and this happened with the state, some states said, you just decide what you're going to do. We're not going to tell you what kind of loans to make. You just have to comply with these rules. You're, it's all your underwriting. It's all your requirements. It's on you. We'll send it to us for the loan guarantee and we'll call it a day. But some tribes may want to say, no, we want you to make these kinds of loans for us. So you can be a lender for us. We'll do the loan guarantee with you or loan participation. But these are the kinds of loans we want you to make. So that's why working with your tribe to design that, um, and especially in a turnkey pre kind of model design way, so that you're working with the trust. So they don't make up a loan program that you can't implement or it doesn't make any sense. Um, and then finally, if you're not a certified CDFI, um, so you're not under tribal, you're, you're not under federal supervision, you're going to have to show that you have sufficient lending experience with small business or commercial lending. Um, and again, the tribe is going to set this up with you as part of their, um, part of their program. Um, okay, so let me go to the chat box real quick uh, and see... We've got, um, can, a loan, can a loan only be made to tribal members of your own tribe or CDFI? So the answer is uh, no. Loans can be made to tribal members no matter where they live. 
any business located on tribal land. So tribal or non-tribal owned business, tribal member owned business. So if you have a, you know, I'll just use my tribe, Pasquayaki tribe. If we have tribal members from Navajo who live on the Pasquayaki reservation and, and want to start up a business, the Pasquayaki tribe can make a loan to the Navajo tribal member on the Pasquayaki reservation. Or Navajo can make a loan to the Navajo tribal member on the Pasquayaki reservation. So you can, you can kind of mix and match that way. It's some geography. Plus, you can make a loan to any business located in any state in which you have tribal members. So again, Pasquayaki, Arizona, Pasquayaki can make a loan to anybody, any small business in Arizona. So it doesn't have to be its own tribal members. Uh, it can focus on tribal member owned businesses, doesn't have to be their own though. So if it's if Pasquayaki says, hey, we're gonna make a loan to any Indian in Arizona, they can do that. It'll count towards their SETI um, and they can do that loan. Um, they, don't also, they, they don't also have to be a member of your own CDFI. This is where I'll get to next week when we talk about partnering with people, extending your coverage, because your coverage right now is limited to your investment area. So what can you do to extend your coverage um, and help the tribe extend its coverage? Um, the definition of tribal member, they don't define it. Uh, there's a question, enrolled member or a descendant, they don't define it. So presumably it's an enrolled member of the tribe. Uh, as, and the key there is if you're an enrolled member of the tribe, no matter where you live, the tribe can make a loan to you. So. Uh, I don't think descendant would qualify for that, but that's a good question to ask uh, Treasury, but not likely. Um, okay, let me motor because I got a few minutes here before I give, we get to the other Q&A. So uh, we've talked about CDFI as lenders. The other opportunity is for CDFIs to be a borrower. So you can get a loan from the tribe. And the tribe can just lend you its SSBCI money, some of it or all of it, and then you would use those funds to re-lend to small businesses and or create a revolving loan fund. You have to comply with the SSBCI requirements. You have to comply. You may have to comply with the tribe's loan requirements, as I discussed earlier, um, including whether the re-lending, you have to re-lend as it's repaid, so a revolving loan fund. And you're still again limited in a re-lending program to your investment area. But the loan to you from the tribe can be zero interest. So when you re-lend it at 13%, you're gonna get to keep the investment income. So that lets you make revenue from the loans that you, that you make. Um, for non-depository CDFIs, this is one way to increase your lending capital, right? So you're not getting money from deposits. Maybe you have limited amount of federal contributions. So this is one way to capitalize you to make loans. Um, and then some states actually negotiated with their CDFIs that at the end of the program, that loan that they had made would basically be forgiven and it would get converted to a grant. And so that money stayed with the CDFI. And the CDFI then, then get, got retained as unrestricted capital. So again, another way to capitalize CDFIs um, through a zero interest or low interest loan from the tribe as part of the SSBCI program that you in turn relend. And again, every time you relend it, it counts towards the tribe's 10 to one. All right, let me pause there and see if there are any questions about the first model, which is tribe as a participant in the program. You're a lender or you're a borrower. I'm sorry, CDFI as a participant in the program. You're either a lender or a borrower. Any initial questions on that or other additional questions, I should say. Okay, let's keep moving then. CDFI is administrator. So there's a couple of models that we've seen that are in the after action reports. And I think one of them was a presentation at the treasury 
on how states worked with their CDFIs to have the CDFI serve as the administrator of the state's program. So in Washington, the state of Washington gave a few million dollars to a CDFI and told the CDFI, you do a direct loan program. You will administer this for us as a direct loan program. So the CDFI, um, the, the state transferred the money to the CDFI. CDFI in turn actually set up some outside, an outside entity uh, to technically make the loans, but the CDFI's job was to originate, service, or underwrite the loan. It allowed them to make direct loans using not their dollars, but SSBCI dollars. Now they did have to come up with the one-to-one, -one, right? So the CDFI put in some of its own money and then it attracted outside capital. And we'll go into this next week about partnering with people who can provide outside capital to help you either meet the one-to-one, -one, because I know a lot of CDFIs may not have enough capital to meet the one-to-one. -one. So where else can I go get that capital from? And in Washington, they went out, they, Wells Fargo put a bunch of money in, they had some other outside investors, they put their own money in, uh, and that created the, they instantly had a five to one uh, when they brought in the outside capital. And then they just make the direct loans. It's all on them. The state only received regular reporting, did some oversight, but the CDFI administered the whole program. Um, the CDFI got to keep the revenue that it generated from the loans. And then at the end of the program, it got to keep the money. So just as with as a borrower, uh, where the CDFI lent money, was, bought, was borrowing the money. In this case, it doesn't borrow the money, it's administering the program. So the state's transferring the money. And this is another turnkey opportunity, right? Where you say to the tribe, transfer your money to us and we will do the direct loan program for you. We'll, we'll bring in the extra capital, the other one-to-one -one capital. We'll work with you on compliance and oversight because the tribe still has to do that. Uh, but this is probably the simplest way to do it. You just get the money from the tribe. You design the grant program. Now you have to tell the tribe what you're going to do because they have to file the application, right? But they would include you as a, a contracting entity of this loan program um, as the administrator of a direct loan program. Uh, you keep the money. It's your underwriting. You still have to comply with SSBCI rules. Uh, you might work with the tribe again on the types of loans that you want to make or where you want to target the loans or the types of businesses you want to support or that the tribe wants to support. So there's probably still some program design in terms of targeting, uh, but a relatively simple process where the CDFI is the administrator. Um, another pro uh, program that was developed in Georgia, hold on, let me, let me see if there's any uh, as a CDFI, but wait a minute, back up here. What capacity would the tribe need to implement these two models? Well, okay, so if the CDFI is just the lender, so they're in the, uh, just another lender, they're alongside B of A, they're alongside the credit union, then the, who, then the question is who's administering the program? Because in that case, the CDFI is not administering, they're just another lender. So the tribe has to have the capacity to administer or it has to find another administrator where the CDFI is the lender or the borrower. Where the CDFI is the administrator, the tribe only needs minimal capacity. So that's one of the biggest benefits to the CDFI being the administrator is the tribe doesn't need to administer. Doesn't have the capacity, it just has to have the oversight capacity uh, as the implementing entity. Um, on the CDFI as the borrower, is the tribe responsible for all reporting? Yes. So if the CDFI is the borrower, just as with any borrower, the tribe has to administer or find someone else to administer. And the, the administrator is going to do all the reporting. The tribe still has to submit the reporting to Treasury, but they're going to get the reporting from their administrator. So if the CDFI is the borrower, someone's got to administer, tribe, someone else, then that administrator will, be, will do the reporting, submit it to the tribe to send it along. 
Okay, as a CDFI borrower, does the CDFI have to show sufficient lending experience if they are certified CDFI? I don't read the policy guidance to, for that. Um, the policy guidance says if you're a certified CDFI uh, in commercial lending, then you are already you already have sufficient lending experience. It's if you if you're if it's a tribal enterprise or if it's not certified that you have to show sufficient lending experience. Um, if the CDFI is the borrower, does the tribe have to have the one-to-one -one match up front? Yeah, well, the tribe's going to have to have some retention of risk, right? So if the tribe is the lender in that case, the tribe's going to have to have some of its own risk. Um, the tribe could say, go to Bank of America and get a loan, and Bank of America has the risk. So there, it's a little unclear on if the tribe makes the loan directly to the CDFI, uh, but the tribe does have to incur some of that risk. Um, okay, in the case of CDFI's administrator, is the loan on the tribe's balance sheet or the CDFI's balance sheet? So what happened in Washington, when this was craft three, and I've got a link to this um, uh, that I'll send over later if you're interested. Craft three set up a separate entity. So they created a new entity. So they had craft three here, craft three here, entity here, and all the other outside investment came into the new entity and the new entity actually made the loan. So those, CD, those SSBCI loans were not on craft's balance sheet. They were on the new entity's balance sheet. Um, now, they could be on your balance sheet if you want them on your balance sheet. If that's going to be helpful for you to have them on your balance sheet, um, otherwise, you can create a separate entity that houses the SSBCI program where the outside investment comes in and the loans are made there and you segregate that risk from the CDFI itself. Um, how does this model get audited, the tribe or the CDFI, if there are non-compliances? The tribe is ultimately responsible for compliance for anybody administering their program. So compliance reporting, the tribe has to show it has its own compliance authorities. So it's gonna have to audit the CDFI. The CDFI is the administrator. The tribe has to be able to audit them. Um, the the uh, administration agreement, as well as the loan participation agreements and the loan guarantee agreements will all have language in them that keeps those books open to the tribe. So the tribe at any time is going to be able to come in and look at any of this. That's part of their audit and compliance requirements. Um, can we use an MDI in replacement of the CDFI? Uh, you know, I haven't looked at the, I'd have to refer to the policy guidance on that. I only, I only look for CDFI letters and not MDI letters. Um, so CDFI can be both an administrator and a lender. I'm going to talk about that next week. So next week, I'm going to talk about the hybrid where a, a CDFI can participate as both a lender and an administrator and what the CDFI has to put in place to do that. Um, so save that question for next week. Okay, let me get back to the uh, presentation. So, um, so no, and no, sorry. So the other program that was used in Georgia was a loan participation model where the CDFI developed the lender network and then it made co-loans with other lenders. So, um, so here's the best example for this. If I've got, you know, I, it's too much money. I can't make a direct loan that big. I need to make bigger loans, but I can make smaller loans. So the tribe would send its SSBCI money to the CDFI for a loan participation program. And the CDFI makes the decision to participate in a loan. So Bank of America comes to the CDFI and says, we have this tribal small business and we're going to make them a $150,000 loan, but we want you to make 50,000 of that 100,000. Then the CDFI would make that decision and make that $50,000 loan. Of course, it's got to track performance. It gets to make that separate loan. Um, and it was co, it could be co-funded um, by the state using SSBCI money 
on a kind of a bulk basis. So some states actually just sent the money to their CDFIs and said, here, run, here's all the money, run it. Other states like Georgia did it on a loan by loan basis. That's a lot, don't need to do it that way, um, but some ways to make this easier. Uh, and as with uh, the direct loan model, the CDFI gets to retain principal and interest for any repaid loans and they can relend and they can of course use that to pay uh, their own costs. Now, the benefit of a loan participation program is it doesn't put CDFI money at risk because you're co-lending to another loan, not your loan. You can't co-lend with your loan, but you can co-lend with Bank of America or another CDFI so or a credit union. So here as administrator, you're not really putting your own money up because you're just administrating, administering. You're getting paid through the loan, the, the co-loan that you've made with the SSBCI money. It's not your money, it's SSBCI money, but you're getting it back. You're getting the interest income and you're relending it and another new loan. So you get to keep that interest income. That's gonna help pay your cost as well, unless you charge other fees. Um, last program for loan guarantee, CDFI is administrator for a loan guarantee. So like the loan participation, you, you develop the lender network, the tribe sends you the money to hold for the loan guarantee fund and reserve. So that's that segregated account that's holding the cash. You're doing the underwriting to approve the loan guarantee coming from another lender. Might be another CDFI, again, another bank, another credit union. Um, you can collect a loan guarantee fee to cover your costs up to 2%. And then you're not making any money on the loan guarantee other than maybe investing it, right? Some investment income. But you're managing the tribe's loan guarantee program. Because again, assuming a tribe doesn't know how to make a loan, assuming a tribe doesn't know how to loan, run a loan guarantee, can't track performance, can't make sure the banks are doing what they're supposed to do. Um, so that's your third kind of program that you can administer. Um, so I'll end with this, that it builds capacity, you're going to generate revenue, and your funds in the end can remain with you as unrestricted capital. And all three of these programs, the money the tribe sends you, whether you're doing it as direct loans, whether you're doing it as loan participation, or whether you're administering loan guarantee, you can negotiate with the tribe at the end that those funds stay with you as unrestricted capital. Um, Okay, just real quick, because I know we're running out of time. We've got to just make sure we're concerned about administration responsibilities. The operational piece is part of the statutory requirements and policy guidance. I've talked about developing a qualified lender network and marketing. That's what you guys do best is to market the program to eligible businesses. Um, let me end with this, and there's more on this presentation. I know Pete's going to send it around. Uh, and we'll follow up next week with some program design and putting all these three, based on the model, uh, putting all these three together. So applications are due February 11th. We don't have much time. Um, the tribe won't get their money until they sign an allocation agreement. Then they'll get the first third. Um, if the tribe submits an application on February 11th, let's say they get approved within 60 days, they get the allocation agreement. They've got to sign it. We probably aren't talking about money until April, May at the earliest. Um, so we've got time to finalize details. That's the key. February 11th, you only need one program. <laughs> tribes only need one program. So if you're working with your tribe or your tribe's interested, design one program. Put it all in the program because here's the other good news. We can amend, we can add, or we can delete programs after initial approval. So if the tribe decides it wants to do a loan participation program, and that's what they submit, and then they decide three months from now, oh, wait, maybe we should do loan guarantee. They can amend it and add a loan guarantee program. Um, if they want to change and they want you, maybe they don't know who's going to administer. And then they start trying to implement it. They go, oh, this isn't going to work. We should bring the CDFI on. 
They can change and they can hire you to administer after the fact. It's better to know beforehand, but they can still make the change later. So the good news is while we got to get our applications in by February 11th, whatever we submit has got to be good enough for government approval, but can be changed later. And we got 10 years to do this. So uh, with that, let me take any last question or two, because I know Pete um, had a couple of other comments um, and announcements he wanted to make. Um, let me go back up here real quick. Where did I leave off? Okay, I left off with the joint. We're gonna talk about that next week. Um, what period of time does the tribe need to participate? This is a 10 year program. Um, so the, the, once that ends, the final reporting period, it's over. Tribes keep the money. If they've given the money to a CDFI, the tribes can ask for the money back or they can let the CDFI keep the money. Most of the states let their CDFIs keep the money. So they didn't ask for it back. Some states ask for it back, but most states let the CDFI keep the money. Um, if the CDFI is making revenue on this, then that's their revenue to make. It's unrestricted program revenue. If the tribe's trying to make revenue, it's unrestricted program revenue. But the goal here isn't to make money for the tribe. Goal here is to lend money. Um, when can the tribe use the revenue profit? Anytime it's unrestricted. Um, tribe, can, tribe has to use this SSBCI money for SSBCI purposes. If it makes revenue or if the CDFI makes revenue from the lending of this money or the guarantee of this money, then that revenue is unrestricted program revenue and can be used at any time. But the point is not to make money. Do not try and make money. Make, mo make enough money to cover your costs. But this is not a for-profit adventure. This is a job creation, small business creation venture. When you have to do your anticipated benefits, they don't ask you how much revenue are you gonna generate for the tribal government? They ask you how much tax revenue are gonna come out of new business activity, but they don't care whether you make money. They do care, of course, whether you're going to be whether it's going to be a sustainable program. So you have to generate some revenue to cover costs. Um, so let's not focus on that too much. Um, if the tribe is met, no, you can't. You have to stay in the program till the final reporting period. After that, then you can spend the money. You can keep the money. Up until then, you got to keep using it the way the program is designed. So if you meet your ten to one, you're not done. You still got to keep going. If you get 20 to one, great. If you get three to one, so be it. The minimum is one to one. Um, if a tribe did not submit, submit an LOI, is there still time? No. The notice of intents are done. You had until December 11th. You cannot submit that. So if you didn't do it, you're not going to get any money. Um, doesn't mean though that you can't participate. So, so one of the things that you, you, you might consider doing as a, as a, well, the tribe itself might be a little bit hard. I want to stay focused on CDFIs. Uh, follow up with me on that question. I think there's another way for tribes that didn't submit their NOI to participate. They won't get any money, but they can still participate. Um, okay, Tata says, Treasury did indicate that we review applications of first serve. Um, yeah, so if you can get it in before February 11th, they'll review it and hopefully approve it. Um, if you're ready to do it, I would say do it. A lot of tribes aren't, but get it in. Uh, they will do it first come, first serve. If you wait till February 11th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time, who knows how long it'll take. Um, the just if At the end, the tribe decides to keep the funds instead of allowing CDFI to keep the funds. It is unrestricted capital to the tribe as well. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's basically turns into a grant, right? It's a grant to the tribe, not technically a grant, but it's a grant to the tribe. So I'm not sure what you mean by unrestricted capital. The tribe can use it after it's done any way they want to. Um, is there a place to check if the tribe submitted the, uh, it's an NOI? Uh, no, Treasury has not told us who has submitted um, NOIs, tribal NOIs. Um, all we know is we've got some sense from people. They, I think they said a couple of weeks ago 
that it was about 380 tribes that submitted an NOI, uh, but they haven't typically. Now, what they will do in the end is show who gets allocations. So they have to report that. So at that point, you can see who didn't get submit an NOI or an application. Um, okay. Sorry, Pete. I know I ran over. I apologize. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. There was, zoom. There was yeah. a Zoom Zoom. No, this was wonderful, Pilar. I mean, it um, you provided everybody so much information. And um, we're going to have this webinar series that's been recorded. And we'll send out the slides on January 6th. It'll be sent to everybody that um, part of the webinar today. So be looking for that. And then we'll also host it on our website, nativecdfi.network.net. Um, one thing that I do want to point out to everybody, um, tomorrow we're having a webinar series on capacity building, how to prepare for a NACA TA application or an FA application. And our first webinar is tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central. And this is for the technical assistance awards. And then on January 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, we'll have the financial assistance discussion. So there's still time to register for those events. And Caleb Selby will be hosting those events on in both um, segments there. But like I said, this webinar has been recorded and we will be sending it out um, on January 6th. So I appreciate um, everybody, um, all your questions and keep them coming. If you have questions, I can forward those on to Pilar. Uh, email those to Pete at nativecdfi.net. And, um, but next week, uh, January 11th, we will be starting at 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern, for the second portion of this uh, webinar. I thank you, Pilar, and I wanna thank our sponsors. I'd like to thank um, Fern Ori, Cor uh, Crystal Cornelius with the Oista Corporation, and Andy Gordon with Clearinghouse CDFI, and Robin Danner with the Sovereign Council of Hawaiian Homestead Association for being co-sponsors with us on this event. They're all four great partners and great advocates for the native CDFIs across the nation. So I thank you. And again, Pilar, I want to thank you. Your webinar was outstanding. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And we'll pick up next week with some of the questions that we didn't get to today, um, as well as bringing it all together uh, and tying it all together into that nice turnkey bow that we need to provide for our tribes. Okay. Stay safe, everybody.